Good evening. Welcome to our service of worship here in Stranmillis EPC. We're really privileged, aren't we, to gather together, even online in this way, and to be able to worship God. And if you're joining with us tonight, then, and you're not normally a part of our congregation, then we want you to know that you're really welcome. And uh, we're delighted that you've tuned in to our service, and we trust that as we all worship God together, we will be blessed in our souls. Well, as we come to think about God's Word, we're going to, first of all, sing uh, to God's praise. And we're going to sing from uh, a version of Psalm 23, The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we come into your presence and we thank you for this psalm. It's a wonderful psalm, one that we know really well. And it it reminds us that you are our shepherd. 
Father, that's a truth that perhaps we've learned from childhood, those of us who have been privileged to be brought up in, in Christian homes. It's a truth that we've known, certainly, in all of our Christian lives, that you are our shepherd, and yet so often we forget that truth, that you carry us uh, in your arms, that you lead us going before us, that you care for us, that you're looking over us. Lord, you are just a wonderful, wonderful shepherd. And we thank you for your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the good shepherd who laid down his life for the sheep. We thank you that he loves his sheep, that he has promised that he will keep each one of his sheep and bring them with him to be in heaven before you, our Father, forever. Oh, our God, what wonderful truth there is in this psalm. And Lord, we know that other parts of your word tell us that we are like wandering sheep. We've gone away from you. We've wandered off and gone our own way and wanted to live life by our own rules, wanted to, to please ourselves. And yet, Lord, you've brought us to see that it hasn't worked and to see that all of our selfishness is actually sinfulness. And you've shown us that our waywardness is not simply a going astray, but it's actually rebellion against you and your holiness. And so we want to thank you that Jesus is that good shepherd who leaves the, the 99 sheep behind in his fold and comes to seek out the one wandering sheep, us, the lost sheep. And when he finds us, that he, that he gently lifts us up and carries us over his shoulder home rejoicing. We thank you that he's dealt with us so truthfully. He's shown us the truth about our sin. And yet he's dealt with us so tenderly. He's picked us up and treated us with grace and compassion and kindness. So we thank you for our saviour and we pray that uh, as, we, as we delight to be loved by him, that too we would delight to love him and show that love in obedience to his word. Father, please be with us tonight to all of those ends and, and help us as we come to study your word that by your spirit we would hear it and listen to it and follow it. May it build us up in our faith. May it challenge any who don't yet know you. May it spur us on to live closer to you. And may it equip us to live in this generation. And Father, as we pray for ourselves, we pray for every church in our denomination and across the world where your word is just being faithfully proclaimed tonight. Please bless your people and be with them. Bless to everyone in, in our congregation who needs you in particular needs tonight. We especially think of those who are grieving the loss of loved ones. And Lord, they're close to our hearts and we love them very much and it pains us to see them going through such times of difficulty. So please, be near to the brokenhearted and wrap your arms of love around them. We thank you that, that we see in the pages of Scripture you even weeping at the tomb of your friend and you knowing in the person of your son, Jesus, what it is to feel grief and pain. And that gives us comfort, Lord. So please be near to those who grieve. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Well, we're going to turn now to God's Word. We're continuing our studies in the life of the prophet Elisha. And so we're turning to 2 Kings chapter 3. 2 Kings chapter 3. We've got quite a lengthy reading, but we're going to read all of this chapter together. And let us hear the Word of God. 2 Kings and chapter 3 and reading at verse 1. In the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Jehoram the son of Ahab became king over Israel and Samaria, and he reigned twelve years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, though not like his father and mother, for he put away the pillar of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he clung to the sin of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. He did not depart from it. Now, Mesha, king of Moab, was a sheep breeder, 
And he had to deliver to the king of Israel a hundred thousand lambs and the wool of one hundred thousand rams. But when Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. So King Jehoram marched out of Samaria at that time and mustered all Israel. And he went and sent word to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Will you go with me to battle against Moab? And he said, I will go. I am as you are. My people as your people, my horses as your horses. Then he said, By which way shall we march? Jehoram answered, By the way of the wilderness of Edom. So the king of Israel went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom. And when they'd made a circuitous march of seven days, there was no water for the army or for the animals that followed them. Then the king of Israel said, Alas, the Lord has called these three kings to give them into the hand of Moab. And Jehoshaphat said, is there no prophet of the Lord here through whom we may inquire of the Lord? Then one of the king of Israel's servants answered, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. And Elisha said to the king of Israel, What have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and to the prophets of your mother. But the king of Israel said to him, No, it is the Lord who has called these three kings to give them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, were it not that I have regard for Jehoshaphat the king of Judah, I would neither look at you nor see you. But now bring me a musician. And when the musician played, the hand of the Lord came upon him, and he said, Thus says the Lord, I will make this dry stream bed full of pools. For thus says the Lord, You shall not see wind or rain, but that stream bed, stream bed shall be filled with water so that you shall drink, you, your livestock, and your animals. This is a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will also give the Moabites into your hand, and you shall attack every fortified city and every choice city. And shall fell every good tree and stall up all springs of water and ruin every good piece of land with stones. The next morning, about the time of offering the sacrifice, behold, water came from the direction of Edom till the country was filled with water. When all the Moabites heard that the kings had come up to fight against them, all who were able to put on armor from the youngest to the oldest were called out and were drawn up at the border. And when they rose early in the morning and the sun shone on the water, the Moabites saw the water opposite them as red as blood. And they said, This is blood. The kings have surely fought together and struck one another down. Now then, Moab, to the spoil. But when they came to the camp of Israel, the Israelites rose and struck the Moabites till they fled before them. And they went forward, striking the Moabites as they went. And they overthrew the cities, and on every good piece of land, every man threw a stone until it was covered. They stopped every spring of water and felled all the good trees, till only its stones were left in Kir Haraseth, and the slingers surrounded and attacked it. When the king of Moab saw that the battle was going against him, he took with him 700 swordsmen to break through, opposite the king of Edom, but they could not. Then he took his oldest son who was to reign in his place and offered him for a burnt offering on the wall. And there came great wrath against Israel. And they withdrew from him and returned to their own land. Amen. And we thank God for giving to us his holy word. A few years ago, it was Christmas time and Claire and I were in our home and there was a, a knock at our door, an unexpected knock, uh, an unexpected visitor. One of Claire's friends, a girl she used to live with at university in England, had uh, come home uh, for Christmas. Uh, we hadn't expected to see her, uh, but she was knocking at our door. Uh, you see, she was flying home through Dublin or she was scheduled to fly home through Dublin. But before she left England, she realised that her passport was out of date. She wasn't going to be able to travel through Dublin without her passport. 
So she flew home through Belfast International Airport, not far from our home, and she stopped off to say hello and Merry Christmas and, and all that on her way home. It was lovely to see her. She had been trying to go to Dublin without the one essential thing she needed. You see, you could fly through Dublin, you could forget your suitcase, you could forget your coat, you could leave behind your snack for the plane, but you can't travel, at least not from England, without your passport. Well, here we are in 2 Kings chapter 3, continuing our studies in the life of the prophet Elisha. And what we're going to see tonight are two kings, the king of Israel and the king of Judah. They're not coming through Dublin, but they're coming into a battle in the desert. And they've forgotten the one essential thing that they need. They've forgotten their Bibles. They haven't picked up their Bibles. They've left them behind. They're coming into battle and they haven't inquired of God. That's what we're going to see tonight. Now, there's many attitudes to God's Word, and it's important for us to think about our attitude to God's Word. That really is what we're thinking about tonight. There's many attitudes in society to God's Word, aren't there? Some people look at the Bible, and they kind of describe it as a book full of stories, nice stories, but not real stories, myths or fables. Sure, they say it's a nice religious book. It's a bit of a crutch for some people who need it. It's not doing any harm, uh, but I wouldn't believe it myself. Other people, well, they see the Bible as a book full of religious truths with moral value, but not historically true and certainly not of any spiritual worth. Other people look at the Bible with disdain or even disgust. They see the Bible as a wicked or an evil book. Sure, look, they say. Look at the evil it's incited people to do. Look at the violence people carry out in the name of God or religion. I wouldn't have anything to do with the Bible myself. Uh, Well, that's the attitude to God's word out there, if I can put it like that, out in society. But that's not really what we're thinking about tonight. What we're thinking about is the attitude of God's church to God's word. You see, here is the king of Israel and the king of Judah. They are the leaders of God's people in the Old Testament, the church. And we're going to see that their attitude to God's word is wrong. They have forgotten their Bibles. They've left them at home. They need to pick up God's word. So as we move through to Kings chapter 3, we're going to see four different attitudes to the word of God. Firstly, I want you to see pretending, pretending. And we're looking at verses 1 to 3. Now, we're, we're being introduced at the start of this chapter to a man called Jehoram. He's the king of Israel, the northern tribes of God's people, uh, the larger uh, collection of ten tribes. He's the son of Ahab, the second son of Ahab, and he succeeded his brother Ahaziah. Uh, if you remember, we looked at Ahaziah in 2 Kings, uh, in chapter 1, our last study in the, book, in the, in the prophecy of Elijah. Uh, he's the, the brother of Ahaziah, and he has succeeded Ahaziah to the throne. This man, Jehoram, has got the appearance of religion, the appearance of religion, but his heart has not been changed. Look at how he's introduced to us in verse 2. He did, we're told, what was evil in the sight of the Lord, though not like his father and mother. For he put away the pillar of Baal that his father had made. So Jehoram is someone who's a bit better than his dad Ahab and his mother Jezebel. He does what's evil in God's sight, but not as bad as they have done. He puts away the pillar of Baal that's in Samaria. That was a a statue to Baal, a statue of Baal that um, Ahab had built and erected in the temple to Baal in Samaria. So he seems to do some good things in Israel. He's not as bad as mum or dad. He's putting away some images of Baal, but we're told in verse 3, He clung to the sin of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. The dumps were closed for quite a while there, and now they're open again. I don't know if you're a bit like us in our house, but we've had a bit of a clear out. 
and we've taken some things that we haven't used very often and cleared out the garage and we've done a good old tidy up to the dump. And maybe you've done that. I don't know if you're a sentimental person or not, but some people find those trips very difficult. There's all sorts of things that they've got. They don't really use them, but they find it hard to let go. Well, this was Jehoram. He was finding it hard to let go of what? The sin of Jeroboam. What was that? It was worshipping the Baal gods. So on the one hand, he seems to be better than mum or dad, putting away some of the big statues to Baal, but on the other hand, he is clinging to the worship of Baal. You see, he's pretending. He's pretending. Outwardly, there's parts of his life that look religious. He's like many people in society today who sort of define themselves by what they don't do or by, their, by whom they're not as badass. I'm not a murderer or a rapist or whatever they say. I'm not like Ahab or Jezebel. And yet they're clinging on to sin, to godlessness, to the worship of some idol which they have created in their heart themselves. They're a bit like the, the Pharisee in that parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. They're comparing themselves always to other people. Lord, I thank you that I'm not like this man. It's many people in our world. They're pretending to be religious. But there, there is something a bit more sinister going on here in terms of what Jehoram is doing. You see, he's a new king. Uh, the political situation is in turmoil. There's been a succession of kings after Ahab. Ahaziah has only reigned for two years. And then Jehoram has come to the throne. There's a lot of instability in Israel. And Moab, one of Israel's uh, tax-paying states, have seen an opportunity to rebel. Its king, Mesha, uh, he's a sheep breeder. And the whole of Moab seems to be uh, very much taken up with the breeding of sheep. And so every year, he brings 100,000 lambs and the, the skin of 100,000 rams to the king of Israel. It's a tax that they pay because Israel historically defeated them in battle. But Mesha sees an opportunity here. This is his chance to stop paying this tax and start making Moab a bit more prosperous. Now, Jehoram knows that to defeat Mesha, the king of Moab, who's got a great army, He's going to need the help of the king of Judah, a man called Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat hates the Baal gods. We'll see in a moment how he has reformed Judah. He swept away the worship of Baal out of those tribes in that country. And Jehoram realizes that it's politically advantageous for him to hide this statue of Baal in Samaria. By the end of his reign, in 2 Kings chapter 10, verses 26 and 27, this statue has made a reappearance when he doesn't need Jehoshaphat's help anymore. It's a bit like perhaps you do, or I do, whenever you're given a present at Christmas. And it's something that you don't really want all that much, but you've been given it by one of your relatives. And so uh, you bring out this ornament and you put it on the mantelpiece whenever that relative's coming around or you put on that jumper whenever you're going to see that particular person and you make a big deal of it. You say, oh yeah, look, I'm wearing it. Uh, look at that. It's got pride of place there on the mantelpiece. But you're pretending because you don't really like it and it's not really there and it's, or it's not really on you at any other time. This is what Jehoram's doing. He's putting away the Baal image to curry favor with Jehoshaphat. But notice that God has seen through this. We're told that he does what is evil in the sight of the Lord. In fact, whenever Jehoram will later come to inquire of God through Elisha, Elisha will greet him by saying, What have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. You think I don't know where your trust is, Jehoram? It's in Baal. I know that. God sees through our pretending. We can't pretend with God. And though it's possible for us to look religious, to pull the wool over other people's eyes, we can never, ever pretend with God. He sees us as we are. He sees 
into our hearts. Here is a man who is pretending. But secondly, I want us to think about Jehoshaphat. And we're going to see in the life of Jehoshaphat that he is a man who is forgetting. He's forgetting. Now, he's the king of Judah, the two southern tribes of God's people. He is a wonderful and admirable character in the Bible. He's reformed the worship of Judah. He's done away with the Baal gods. He cleared them out of Judah. He's helped the national life of the people of Judah. He is described in 1 Kings chapter 22 and at verse 43 as walking in all the way of Asa, his father. He did not turn aside from it, doing what was right in the sight of the Lord. He is a good king. And yet here we see him joining an alliance and going into battle with an evil, godless king. Now why? Why, Jehoshaphat? Why are you doing this? Well, can I suggest to you that it's because Jehoshaphat has forgotten the spiritual lessons that he has already learned in his life. Twice already in his reign, he has been taught by God that he shouldn't join an alliance with a godless king of Israel. He's already done it with Ahab, and he's already joined an alliance with Ahaziah. You know, sometimes in life... Uh, Men, if I can speak to you for a moment. There's a DIY job that you have to do. It's not something that you do very often, maybe once a year or even less than that. And every time you come to do it, you've kind of forgotten how to do it. You relearn it, maybe a little bit quicker every time. And you think, I've got it this time. I know how I'm going to do that. But whenever you come to have to do it again, well, you've forgotten it. You're not doing it often enough that you can really remember exactly what you've got to do. This is Jehoshaphat. Spiritually, he's forgotten the lesson that God has taught him. You see, he's joined an alliance already with Ahab. We read about that in 2 Chronicles chapter 19. I'll let you look it up yourself at home. Uh, There he's gone into a battle, uh, the battle of Ramoth Gilead uh, with King Ahab. He's had a near miss. An archer is uh, pulled randomly on his bow, shot up into the air, and amazingly, Jehoshaphat there in no armor and all his kingly robes, and Ahab there disguised in a full suit of armor, but Ahab has been killed. On the way home, Jehoshaphat's been met by one of God's prophets, a man called Jehu. And he has told Jehoshaphat very clearly that he ought not to have gone into battle with a godless king like Ahab. He's been taught the lesson and it's been reinforced for him. But then a few years later, he's gone again and joined an alliance with Ahab's son, Ahaziah, Jehoram's older brother. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 35 to 37, you can read about this. He has agreed that he's going to build a fleet of ships with Ahaziah, and they're going to go and assault Tarshish. But before that fleet has even left harbor, God has destroyed it. A man, a prophet called Eliezer, meets Jehoshaphat and tells him in no uncertain terms, you shouldn't have joined an alliance with a godless king like Ahaziah. Twice he's been taught this lesson. Twice it's been reinforced by God's prophet to him. But here he is again, going into battle with Jehoram. And at most, this is just two years after he's joined Ahaziah. Now why? Why has Jehoshaphat forgotten these spiritual lessons so quickly? Well, I think it's because his attitude to God's word is all wrong. You see, Jehoshaphat is treating God's word a bit like an insurance policy. You know what I mean by by treating it like an insurance policy? You've got an insurance policy on your car, but probably if I was to ask you, well, what's the terms and conditions in that policy? Exactly what does it include? You might not be able to tell me offhand. But if you needed that policy, you'd quickly go and look up the terms and conditions, wouldn't you? And this is what Jehoshaphat is doing. You see, 
Jehoram's come and asked him to go into battle with him. But he hasn't inquired of God. He hasn't read God's word. He hasn't prayed to God. He hasn't sought out a prophet of God to ask him, should he do this? He's just said, yeah, I'll go. And then as the army have marched out into the desert and they've gone round in circles and they haven't been able to find any water for themselves or their flocks, then he has said, in the moment of crisis, when he suddenly needs God's word, he has said, is there no prophet, verse 11, of the Lord here, through whom we may inquire of the Lord? It's a great question. It's the right thing to do. But Jehoshaphat, it's too late. You should have inquired of the Lord before you went into battle and took God's people into battle. There's a really chastening contrast with the servant of Jehoram, the servant of the king of Israel. In the second half of verse 11, he knows where God's prophet is. Then one of the king of Israel's servants answered, Elisha, the son of Shaphat is here, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. Here's a servant of a godless king, but he knows where God's prophet is. And I think, brothers and sisters, that there's a lesson for us in the life of Jehoshaphat. How often does God teach us spiritual lessons that we quickly forget? He's corrected us in some area of our lives. His word has come and put its finger on us. We have known that we've strayed from God or he has motivated us to some new sphere of service or he's brought us along in our Christian growth and grace and we've learned lessons and we're excited about them. And for a season, for a time, we are walking closely with God. But then our attitude to his word grows cold. We put it in our back pocket like an insurance policy. We don't inquire of God. We do our own thing and then perhaps we inquire of God. And sometimes God wakes us up with unexpected means like Jehoram's servant. Uh, we see the, the love and devotion of a new Christian, a new convert, and it kind of puts us to shame. Or our children ask us a question that just puts their finger on our inconsistency. What must we do to God when we see our own spiritual forgetfulness? We must confess what we've been like to God. We must resolve to inquire of the Lord, but we mustn't despair, brothers and sisters. We mustn't despair because God doesn't cut us off. Look at verse 14. There's this lovely little detail here. As Jehoram, the king of Israel, comes to inquire of Elisha, and Elisha dismisses him, he says, Ask the Lord of hosts lives, were it not that I have regard for Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I wouldn't look at you or see you. It's only because of Jehoshaphat, one of God's children who's righteous in God's sight, that I'm going to listen to you, Jehoram, he says. Jehoshaphat hasn't been cut off, though he's forgetful. God hasn't forgotten about him. Brothers and sisters, though we often forget God's lessons for us, he doesn't forget about us. And there is comfort and encouragement for us there. So we've seen one king who is pretending, another who is forgetting. Now I want you to look at a prophet, Elisha, and I want you to see that he is proclaiming. He is proclaiming. Here he is in the middle of the desert. Crisis point for God's people has been reached. God has been sought. And all of a sudden, in this text, Elisha appears. We don't know why he's there. He's been in Samaria before. Perhaps he's hearing that the, the army, he's heard that the army are marching out, and he's thought to himself, I should go too. Whatever. God's Spirit has obviously moved him to be in this desert. God has arranged that his word will be there through his prophet. And I want you to notice that Elisha comes and speaks, he proclaims God's word in three particular ways. Firstly, he confronts sin. He confronts sin, verse 13. And Elisha said to the king of Israel, what have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your father and to the prophets of your mother. 
Here's Jehoram, a new king. First impressions count. And here's the first time that we read of Elisha speaking to this king. And he speaks directly. And he speaks honestly. And he speaks in a way that is exceptionally convicting. Go to your own prophets. You have got nothing to do with God. He is confronting sin. Now why? Because God's honor is at stake. Look at what Jehoram is saying about God at the end of verse 13. But the king of Israel said to him, no, it is the Lord who has caused these three kings to give them into the hand of Moab. Perhaps that sounds like a good thing. He's owning and confessing God's sovereignty. But actually, actually, I think he's blaming God here. Go to your own gods, Elijah has said. Go to the Baal gods. No, no, no. It's the Lord God who's brought us out here. It's God's fault we're here in the desert. That's what Jehoram is saying. Like many people in our society today, he doesn't want much to do with God, but he's ready to blame God quite quickly. And Elisha, knowing that God's honor is at stake, stands up for God. He confronts sin. Now that takes great courage. It makes me think of John the Baptist. You remember that story when John the Baptist is confronting King Herod in Mark chapter 6. And we read there that it was, it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he'd married her. And John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. He didn't say it once. He had been saying to Herod repeatedly because God's honor was at stake. And John the Baptist knew he needed to stand up for God's honor. And you know, whenever we confront sin, when we stand up for God's honor, there may be consequences. John the Baptist lost his head. There may be consequences in our work in our family, in our circles of friends. But God calls us to be faithful and to stand up for his honor. And sometimes that means that as we proclaim God's word, it will confront sin. But that's not all Elisha does. As well as confronting sin, notice secondly that he offers grace. He offers grace. Verses 16 to 20. And he said, thus says the Lord, I will make this dry stream bed full of pools. And God is going to come with a miracle. They're not going to see wind or rain, but this stream bed is going to fill up with water and supply the army and the livestock with the water that they need. And, says Elisha, that's not all. That's a light thing in God's sight. Verse 18. He's also going to give the Moabites into your hands. He's going to give you the victory in battle. It's grace upon grace here in the desert. And there's a wonderful picture in verse 14 of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because Elisha says to Jehoram, As the Lord of hosts lives, before whom I stand, were it not that I have regard for Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would neither look at you nor see you. If it wasn't for the king of Judah standing before me, says God's prophet, I wouldn't answer you. Reminds us, doesn't it, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the king of Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah. And God, through Jesus, has given to us grace upon grace. Isn't that what John tells us in John 1 and verse 16? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glorious of the only Son from the Father. For from His fullness we have all received grace upon grace. He offers grace. But notice that these kings have got to act and receive that grace. They've got to act on this grace. They've got to believe the gospel. They've got to believe what Elisha is saying. And they've got to go and fight. 
And you know, God offers us grace in the gospel. And we must act on that proclamation, that offer of grace. It's not simply enough to hear about God's grace. We must receive it by faith. So here's Elisha proclaiming in the desert, and he's confronting sin. He's offering grace. But thirdly, I want you to see that he is preparing his own heart. He's preparing his own heart. We've got this strange little detail in verse 15. But now he says, bring me a musician. And when the musician played, the hand of the Lord came upon Elisha. What is happening here? Is Elisha working himself up into some kind of spiritual frenzy? Is he setting the emotional mood music before this great miracle is about to be performed? No. Uh, I think that he is angry with Jehoram. He's answered him very directly in verses 13 and 14. His anger has been aroused by the pretense, the hypocrisy of this king of Israel. And so he knows that before he comes to inquire of God and then speak on God's behalf, he needs to prepare his own heart. He needs to settle himself down. And so he asks for this music to be played, that he will be prepared to speak and serve the Lord. Now, we prepare for many things in life. Job interviews, you prepare copiously for one, wouldn't you? Now, your exam at, sco at school or university, you prepare, you revise, you study. Sometimes even conversations we're going to have with someone when we're, we're not quite sure what we're going to talk about, so we kind of make a little mental list of what we're going to go through with them. Dates. You buy a new outfit. You plan what you're going to do. Do we prepare for listening to and sharing the Word of God? You remember when we studied the, the book of Ecclesiastes last year, and uh, we studied that really lovely passage in Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 5. It was quite a challenging passage. And there we read these words from Solomon. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. Don't be rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth. And Solomon is reminding us of the importance of preparing ourselves for worship, of thinking about what we are coming to do, of being engaged, not simply in body, being here, going through the motions, but of being engaged in our minds. And I think, brothers and sisters, that perhaps during this period of lockdown, when we have been engaging with worship online, we've been coming and sitting on our sofa, and there's more distractions around us perhaps than normal, uh, that is something that we need to pay particular attention to. We need to be preparing our hearts for worship, not simply coming and kind of sitting down on the sofa at the last minute, grabbing our cups of coffee, flicking on YouTube thoughtlessly and entering into it, but really thinking about who we are coming before, stilling ourselves in the presence of God. The Lord Jesus, before he teaches his disciples how to pray in the Sermon on the Mount, he talks to them about going into their closet, praying to God in secret, preparing their hearts. So Elisha is proclaiming. He's confronting sin. He's offering grace, but he's doing that as he prepares his heart. So we've seen Jehoram pretending, Jehoshaphat forgetting, Elisha proclaiming. But very quickly, I want you to see Mesha, the king of Moab. Here is a man who is despairing. There's a picture in verses 21 to 27, of what life without God and his word looks like. And it is a despairing picture of hopelessness. The king of Moab is ready for battle. And as Moab gets up at the crack of dawn to go and fight Israel, well, there's all of a sudden water in this desert that hasn't been there before. But it's a red sky in the morning. And so the reflection of the sun hits off that water 
and not expecting to see water, the Moabite army think it's blood. Well, they draw the conclusion. Israel and Judah and Edom have fought with each other. Civil war's broken out. It's been a bloodbath. Look, there's blood everywhere. Let's go to the spoil, Moab. Let's go and take all their possessions. And they walk straight into the trap that God has set for them. They are there in Israel and Judah's hands. Mesha gathers up 700 of his best troops and he goes and tries to attack the weak spot off the battle line, the king of Edom, but he can't break through. And so he turns to his last resort, his last throw of the dice. He believes in a God called Chemosh and Chemosh requires child sacrifice. And so Mesha takes the crown prince, his eldest son, he puts him on the wall of the city he's outside and he sacrifices his own son. It's an awful, tragic event. But here's the thing. It seems to work. Look at verse 27. Then he took his oldest son who was to reign in his place and offered him for a burnt offering on the wall. And there came great wrath against Israel. And they withdrew from him and returned to their own land. What does this mean? How does this work? Has Chemosh got some power that we don't know about? What I think is going on here is that great wrath against Israel means for us that Israel's disgust was arisen as they've seen what Mesha has done to his own son. They've kind of lost the heart for battle. It's disgusting what he has done. This violated God's word very expressly in Leviticus. And they're disgusted by this, so they withdraw. Do you see that? And they withdrew from him. They go back to their own homes. They've lost the stomach for the battle. But it's worked, at least temporarily for Mesha. He seems to have got a result. Living life without God's word seems to have worked. Trusting in Chemosh seems to have worked for a time. But let me ask you, what's he left with? Well, he's left without his eldest son, the crown prince who was to reign in his place, has been offered as a burnt offering. He's left despairing, surely, isn't he? His life is left empty and ruined and spoiled. And you know, that describes many people in this world who are trying to live their lives without God and his word. They go their own way. They live life on their agenda and with their rules. And things seem okay. They seem to get by. It seems to work. They seem happy for a time. But deep down, gnawing away at them, there is a void and emptiness, something that they can't fill. It's like the prodigal son. When he rejects his father, he goes away from him to another land. And for a time, it's all good. There's parties, there's fun. He's got friends. But all goes wrong. And he lives life, eating or wishing he could eat. The food that the pigs were eating. And it reminds us that there is an emptiness, a despairing emptiness to life without God. And I want you to see the contrast that there is between what, Kem- what Mesha believes and the grace that God offers. You see, Mesha believes that he can win the favor of his God by sacrificing his son. But look at verse 20. There's this interesting little detail. There we are told that the next morning, after Elisha has promised that there will be streams of water everywhere in this desert, the next morning, about the time of offering the sacrifice, behold, water came from the direction of Edom till the country was filled with water. When did the miracle happen? At the time of the morning sacrifice. You see, it reminds us, brothers and sisters, that we serve a God who is so different from Chemosh. He does not require us to offer up our own children to win his favor. Instead, he graciously gives us his favor by offering his own son. 
What a God we have. What grace there is in the gospel. And can I ask you, how are you treating this book? What is your attitude like to this book? Are you pretending? Like you're whoring? Pretending you're putting on a facade of religion. You're defining your life by what you don't do and who you're not like. But deep down, you're clinging on to sin. Are you forgetting like Jehoshaphat? You've learned lots from God. He's taught you many spiritual lessons, but like so often I am, you're slow to learn and you're quick to forget. And you've forgotten and you've grown cold and you need to pick up your Bible. Are you proclaiming like Elisha? Are you offering grace? Are you confronting sin? And are you preparing your heart? Are you picking up your Bible? Are you going into the closet? And, or are you like Mesha, despairing, living life without God? Pick up your Bible. This is God's word. This is God's wisdom. This book brings life when God's Spirit comes and applies its truth to our hearts. Pick up your Bible. Pick it up in faith. Pick it up frequently. Pick it up looking to God. And pray that God would teach you, show you wonderful things through it, and that he would help you to obey it, that we may be not only hearers, but doers of his word. Amen. And may God bless his word to our hearts. Well, we're going to close our service now by singing together uh, this great hymn, which reminds us of what our Lord Jesus Christ does for us as he represents us in heaven. Just as Jehoshaphat seemed to stand before Elisha and represent the kings to him, so Christ represents us before his Father in heaven, before the throne of God above. I have a strong, a wonderful plea, a great high priest whose king is love, who ever lives and pleads for me.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Well, thank you for being with us tonight. And we trust you've been blessed as we've considered God's word. Good night and God bless. Mm -hmm.